friends. We want to welcome you to morning devotions here at GYC. And I, I opened my phone this morning. It's at 1231, the last day of the year. And what better way to end the year by spending it together here, seeking God at GYC. And if any of you are from the West Coast like I am, and you haven't adjusted to the time zone yet, thank you for being here, even if it feels like 4 a.m. We are expecting a blessing from God this morning, and we are going to enjoy another message from God's Word brought to us by Tondo. I want to invite you to join me on your knees as we prepare our hearts this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we're coming to you this morning to your throne, not to seek you in some casual, routine, ordinary way, but really, Lord, we are seeking your blessing this morning, so please be with us. Lord, forgive us for our sins and prepare our hearts. Open us up and do inside of us, Lord, only what you can do. Give us soft hearts and sharp minds to receive your message this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will enjoy music brought to us by my friends Sarah and Stephanie Draggett with a message from Tondo immediately following.
Good morning, GYC. Good morning. Are we alive and well this morning? Yes. yes, we are. Praise the Lord. You know, before I came up here yesterday, I don't know if you guys realized how nervous I was. And then when I got up here, I realized, you know what? I'm on stage. Can't go back now, right? <laughs> Might as well just preach. Um, and it was an interesting no turning back experience. But um, I have been tremendously blessed. Have you been blessed? Amen. Have you been encouraged? Amen. And I'm so happy to see us here this morning. And I do want to ask us for one small favor um, this morning. You know, yesterday, going around the halls, running around for some logistical issues, I saw quite a few of our brothers and sisters just wandering in the hallways. And I know that as we are here, I would ask us to be our brother and our sister's keeper. Can we do that? So if you see a brother or a sister just wilding time in the hallway, when meetings are going on, kindly, in, in the meekness of Christ, encourage them to come into the meetings. Can we do that? Just be our brother and sister's keeper. And our message this morning the title is Nothing Less. Nothing Less. And as we begin, I am going to warn you that we're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning. So please have your Bibles, your pens, your pencils, and have your minds sharp and ready to reason through the Word of God this morning. I shared with you yesterday my testimony about taking a year off to do the campus missionary training program after my sophomore year at Harvard. And taking that year off at the risk of losing my scholarship, losing my education. But how it is that God was faithful to restore everything to me at the end of that year off. And I told you that the story did not end there, so I'll finish it this morning. When I went back to Harvard to finish my junior and my senior years, God made it abundantly clear to me that he was calling me into full-time youth and campus ministry through his word, through his providence, and through the burden that he placed upon my heart. There was no doubt to me that God was calling me into full-time youth and campus ministry. And I made up my mind by the grace of God to obey him, no turning back, right? Until May 2010, commencement week, graduation week, when all of a sudden, the realization of what I was doing hit me with full force. And you know, commencement week is this pomp and circumstance at Harvard, and you're mingling with some of the elites of the elite, right? Harvard graduates who have done amazing things in their lives, alumni who have gone on to glittering careers in business and medicine in different areas of what this world considers success. And suddenly, it dawned on me that one could do so much with a Harvard degree because that name opens so many doors, right? That's what the world says because it's considered one of the world's best universities. And that week of graduation was arguably one of the most depressing weeks of my life. And friends are asking, Tanda, what are you doing when you graduate? I'm going to be a missionary. <laughs> and when I came back from the graduation ceremony, all decked in my gown, my cap, and having my degree in my hand, I went back home to my room and I just sat down and I was fighting back tears. And I cannot describe to you the tension in my mind and the thoughts, the questions that were racing through my mind. And I asked the Lord to say, Lord, why would you call me to do this? And I thought back to my life growing up and how God had led me down a path of clear academic success. Growing up in Swaziland, and every time we took national exams, being the best student ever with perfect scores. Perfect scores in my IB diploma exams, early admission to Harvard, and now here I was with a chemistry degree, and God was saying, Tando, I'm calling you to full-time campus ministry. 
And I thought to myself, surely, Lord, you led me down this path for a reason. Surely God wouldn't lead me so far just to have me waste this academic success in ministry. Would he? And those questions troubled me. And I think that experience is a common one in our Christian journey. When the will of God takes us to places that seem to make no logical human sense. When the will of God is so crystal clear, but we don't understand why he would call in such a way. And we sit back and we're tempted to say, God, why would you ask me to do this? And yet Jesus taught us how to pray. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And every time we pray those words, we're saying that if we've given ourselves to God, we always ask the question, God, what will you have me do? And when God reveals his will, and questioning obedience is imperative, nothing less. Let's pray together as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come this morning yet again to hear a word from you. Father, you've spoken to our hearts in so many ways already this weekend. We're blessed, we're encouraged, we're inspired. This morning we seek yet another word. And Father, we pray that in spite of the fatigue and the weakness of my human frame, the Lord, you would condescend to speak through me, that every heart here would hear a word from your throne. Father, we ask that your spirit would be amongst us this morning, for it is the Holy Spirit that presses the truth home to every heart and brings conviction upon our souls. So, Father, send him to be with us this morning. Speak to us. Draw us nearer to Christ. And teach us what it means to be like him, to follow him in the path of self-denial. It's for this we pray. And we ask believing, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing less. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, who wrote a book entitled The Cost of Discipleship that I would encourage you to read if you haven't read it. I'm going to read with you one quotation that never fails to pause, at least to make me pause and think. Bonhoeffer wrote this. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Death in Jesus Christ, the death of the old man or nature at his call. Jesus' summons to the rich young man was calling him to die because only the man who is dead to his own will can follow Christ. In fact, Every command of Jesus is a call to die with all our affections and lust. Notice how Bonhoeffer says every command of Jesus is a call to die and that the only person, the only man or woman who can follow Christ is the one who has died to his own will. For when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. And Christ himself said very clearly, if any man will come after me, if you will come, and here's how he wants us to come, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's Luke 9.23. 
if any man will come after me. And that's how Jesus wants to be followed. Come and die. And as we begin our study, I want us to understand, friends, that Jesus makes this call on the premise of his own example. Because he stands as the example of what he calls us to do in unreserved surrender to the will of God. Take your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Arguably my favorite gospel. John chapter 1, when you're there, say amen. John chapter 1, and we're going to look at how Jesus set the example and how he calls us to follow in his footsteps in coming and dying. John chapter 1, are we there? Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And I love how John begins his gospel here by reminding us about this being he calls the Word. And in verse 1, three things about the Word. He was in the beginning, he was with God, and he was God. In the beginning, meaning he's eternal and preexistent. He was with God, being a distinct person of the Godhead, and he was God, being he is divine. He was God. And then this Word is also a creator, according to verse 3. And then in verse 4, in him was life, right? And now having told us about this word, John then identifies him in verse 14. And in verse 14, he identifies the word in very clear unequivocal terms. And he says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this being who is the Word, this eternal pre-existing being who is divine, who is God, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And so John's gospel begins by telling us very clearly that Jesus is God. His divinity is very clearly affirmed. He was in the beginning, he was with God, and he was God. And the rest of the Bible agrees with this concept. Go to Hebrews chapter 1 and just see one instance of this. In Hebrews chapter 1, and agreeing with John in affirming Christ's divinity. Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of the book of Hebrews begins in verse 1 by saying, Are we there? Okay. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and so Christ is described in verse 3 as the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. And again, affirming Christ's divinity. And then in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1, the Father himself affirms Christ's divinity. And verse 8 reads, But unto the Son, he, God, saith, Unto the Son, God saith, Thy throne, O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. And so God the Father acknowledges the divinity of his Son. And as Colossians 2, 9 tells us, in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So let there be no doubt in our minds that Jesus was God. His divinity is crystal clear. And Isaiah 9, 6, that famous promise calls him the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is God. 
And yet now we, trans we transition to the, the mystery of godliness that Paul addresses in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And keeping in your minds that Jesus is divine. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, I'll give you a minute to get there. Bible students. Are we there? Keeping in our minds that Jesus is fully God. And Paul writes, without controversy, great in verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It's a mystery, okay? The mystery of the fact that Jesus came down, being fully God, to be our Emmanuel God with us. And that he walks the earth being fully God and being fully man. That the Gospels tell the story of Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, who was also mysteriously God the Son. And Paul says without controversy, it's a great mystery that God was manifest in the flesh, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so you're seeing this crystal clear picture of who Jesus is, being fully God, being fully man. But our study this morning takes us to the heart of Christ's life while here on earth. Being fully God, being fully vested with the powers of divinity in himself, having the fullness of the Godhead bodily in him, he came down here and lived a life of nothing less an unreserved surrender to the will of his Father. If you turn back now to the Gospel of John, I want to show you how the theme of the Father's will ruled the life of Christ. And I warned you about the turning scriptures pages this morning. I hope it's keeping you awake. In John chapter 4, let's begin there. And just see how Christ's life was ruled by the will of the Father. In John chapter 4, are we there? Are we all there? Okay. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus speaking says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus meets his greatest satisfaction, his deepest joy was to do the will of his Father. And John chapter 5, just one chapter over in verse 30, the same truth is repeated. In John chapter 5 and verse 30, and again speaking, Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing, and as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. He came down from heaven to seek not his own will, but the Father's will. And in John 6, 38, that we read from yesterday, Jesus says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Do you see how the words will and sent are being repeated here? Do you see that? Do you see that, friends? Do you see the repetition of the will of the Father and him that sent me? And that Christ came down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. And that as he walked the earth, being fully, fully God, he surrendered himself to the will of his Father. And in a beautiful exposition of Christ's surrender, Paul writes, 
Philippians chapter 2. Arguably one of the most beautiful and deepest passages on Christ's life ever written. And we're going to study that this morning. In understanding Christ's call to come and to die. Philippians chapter 2. When you get there, please say amen. amen. I'm reading from verse 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So as you and I reflect on Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 this morning, that Christ humbled himself and became obedient to his father's will, even to the point of death on the cross. His life was a life of not my will but thine, nothing less than unreserved surrender, nothing less than radical abandon to the will of God, even to the point of death on the cross. And so think about him in Gethsemane. Think about him kneeling upon the ground, praying that crushing prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet nevertheless, not my will but thine. And let us not think for one minute that Gethsemane was easy. It was not. Gethsemane wasn't easy. No man sweats great drops of blood if it's easy. Calvary wasn't easy either. The submission was painful. His humanity felt the crushing weight of sin and of being man's sin bearer. But feeling that crushing weight and being tempted to go back, being tempted to say, it's enough, I'm going back to heaven. Christ surrendered, weathered the pain. And he said, Father, not my will but thine. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if this cup cannot pass from me, except I drink it, let thy will be done. And so he walks to Calvary. They're beating him. They're spitting in his face. You ever had somebody spit in your face? I hope not. And I don't think any of us would have the audacity to spit in our president's face, for example, right? And here were these human beings spitting in the face of their creator, spitting in the face of the one who sustained their lives. And Jesus stands there, being fully God, having the power in himself to end his own suffering because he was still fully God but not my will, but thine. See him being hung on the cross, the nails piercing his, his hands and his feet, dying the death of a condemned criminal. And all the while, he's fully God, and he had the power in himself to come down from the cross but not my will, but thine. He chose to give himself over to the will of the Father. He gave himself over. And then Paul explains why in Philippians 2 verse 7. As you think about Christ's surrender, he is why he could make that surrender. In verse 7, Paul says, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. 
Do you see the word servant in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2? The word servant, translated servant in our English Bibles, is the Greek word doulos. What's the word, everyone? Doulos. The Greek word doulos. Do you know what the word doulos means? Slave. Bondman. The word doulos implies somebody who voluntarily gives himself over to another's will. Someone who chooses to be a slave to somebody else. That's doulos. It's never forced. It's a choice to become a slave to another. And so Jesus made himself of no reputation, made himself a slave of God. He chose to surrender completely to his father's will, a slave of God. And so when Jesus calls a man, when Christ calls me and you, he calls us to the same kind of surrender. On the premise of his example, he was a slave of God. And if we call ourselves disciples, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, Christ's footsteps go down the path of radical abandon to the will of God, slavery to God, a conscious choice. Are there any disciples of Jesus this morning? Is there anybody who will follow Christ in the footsteps of due loss? Are there disciples of Christ this morning? If any man will come after me, deny himself, take up the cross daily, and follow me. In the path of servanthood, the path of doulos, the path of radical, reckless abandon to God's will. But here's the cutting point, friends. Whereas Jesus did not have to surrender, we actually have to. And you know why? Because we've got two choices. Do loss for us has two and only two choices. And those choices are very crystal clearly stated in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, where Paul again uses the word do loss. And as you turn to Romans chapter 6, let me remind you too that the Bible is full of examples of men and women who understood Christ's do loss and made it their own. Did you know, for example, that Paul calls himself a slave of Christ? That in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, when Paul says, I'm a servant of Christ, that word is do loss, a slave of Jesus. And many others do the same thing too. And in Romans chapter 6, writing for you and for me, Paul has this to say. I'm going to begin in verse 16. Are we there? Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And verse 20, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from what? Righteousness. Do you see the word servant in verse 16, 17, 19, and 20? Do you see it? You see the word servant there? Do you know what the word servant there is in the Greek? Anybody care to guess? It's the word doulos. The word servant in verse 16, 17, 19, and 20 is the Greek word doulos. Slave or bondman. So what Paul is saying here, friends, is that we've got two choices. Either we are slaves to sin or we are slaves to whom? To God and to Christ. Now look, too, at the fact that it's a voluntary choice. Verse 16, you yield yourself as a servant to sin or servant to God. Nobody forces you. 
you choose to enslave yourself to sin or to enslave yourself to God. You choose to surrender, to give yourself voluntarily to the will of sin or the will of God. Is there a third choice? Is there? You're not convincing me, GYC. Is there a third choice? Is there any middle ground? Is there any gray zone? Okay, so why is it so hard to surrender all to God then? Do you know what it means to be a slave to sin? I'm sure we all know. Controlled by habits, controlled by passions we cannot break. And guess what? Amazingly, God wants to free us. Amen? But freedom comes at a cost. Being then made free from sin. Look at verse 22 of Romans chapter 6. But now, verse 22, being made free from sin, you became what? Servants to whom? To God. So, yes, Jesus set the example of due loss. Voluntary slavery to the will of God. But he didn't have to. For me and for you, controlled by the habits of sin. The choice is imperative. Because understand with me that the logic of Romans 6 says very clearly, friends, if you are not a slave to God, you are by implication a slave to what? To sin. Now look at verse 23. Look at verse 23 where Paul then concludes the whole matter by saying, the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life. So now any logically reasoning human being, okay, there are two choices. Either I'm a slave to God or I'm a slave to sin. And I think, friends, that anybody who has a, a mind to reason and think if sin leads me to death and God gives me the gift of eternal life, the choice, the most sensible thing to do is to do what? To choose God. To say, I'm going to break free by the grace of God from sin and make myself choose to make myself a slave of God. Because the other choice leads you to death. There's no middle ground. There's no picket fence to stand on. Either you're in this camp or that camp, one or the other. Either God has all of you, your entire heart and mind, and you're his slave, or you're a slave to sin. Nothing less than a complete do-loss experience is what God expects. And you know God cannot accept anything less than that? Do you know that? Because if he does accept less than that, he would be leaving us in slavery to sin because there's no middle ground, friends. There's no middle ground. So when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. He bids him come and die. In the premise of his own example. And the call is as clear, as clear can be. In Steps to Christ, page 43, the servant of the Lord writes, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. We must submit to God, surrendering all to the will of God. And as I was thinking about my experience that I shared with you of graduation week, standing there thinking, how could God ask me to take my Harvard degree and, and shelve it and become a full-time worker in campus ministry? It made no sense. But the point is this, friends. If we've made up our minds to voluntarily give ourselves to the will of God, when God commands, the answer must always be, yes, Lord. 
Even if you don't understand why he commands, he is God. And if you've chosen to be his slave, you must always answer yes. And I think that some of, some of us friends think that God owes us an explanation. We think that God must explain to us why he does what he does. Is God God? Does God see the end from the beginning? Does God know what he's doing? Then why do we struggle to surrender all? Is he God? Some of us think we can tell God how to do his job. Worse yet, some of us have the foolish thought that we could do better than God at managing our lives. We think we know better than he knows. Friends, God's will doesn't always need to make sense because if he's God, he knows what he's doing. Just obey him. Don't ask why, just obey. Choose to have a do-loss mindset because the only other option to that is slavery to sin, leading you to death. Listen to this, Steps to Christ, page 46. God does not require us to give up anything that is for our best interest to retain. In all that God does, he has the well-being of his children in view. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. Did you get it, friends? Did you get that? To think and to act contrary to the will of God is to do the greatest injury and injustice to your own soul. It's the greatest injury and injustice. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him who knows what is best and who plans for the good of his creatures. There's no real joy to be found in disobedience to the will of God. And God will accept nothing less than absolute surrender of the mind, the heart, the will, the strength, the entire being to his control. Servant of the Lord writes, so you can bring something less, God will not accept it. It's as simple as that. Try to come to God with a mindset less than do loss, he will not accept it for two reasons. First, because Christ's example was out of due loss. He walked the steps of radical abandon to God's will. Second reason, if we are not slaves of God, we are slaves of sin. And God does not want either you or me to live a life of slavery to sin because that leads us to death. The mind must choose to voluntarily give itself up to the will of God. And I think sometimes we, we struggle because we don't trust the heart of God. We think that God is out to hurt us. What kind of God do you serve? Can you imagine if you were married and you thought your husband or wife was always out to hurt you, how long would that marriage last? Would it even survive a week? And yet we think that God, who has done the most amazing thing in giving us Jesus Christ, in sacrificing everything he could to save us, we think that this God is out to hurt us. And I say, how, much, how do you think that makes God feel? That his children that he has loved so much, don't trust his will. How 
must that make God feel? God expects nothing less. And better yet, he deserves nothing less than absolute surrender on the premise of Christ's example and for what God has given to us. God expects, God deserves nothing less. Let me give you a rule to live by. And that rule is given very succinctly in John chapter 2, verse 5, where Mary, the mother of Jesus, instructs the servants at the feast, the wedding at Cana. And she says something that's simple, profound, and is a rule of life for a Christian. Underline that verse, write it on your wall, put it on your Facebook status, make it the rule of your life. John 2 verse 5, Mary says, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. It's that simple. It doesn't need to make sense. Just do it. God has said so. Just do it. He is God. And you're his slave because you've chosen to give yourself to God. It's a simple rule to live by. And as you make that commitment, don't worry about how you will sustain it. Jesus does the sustaining. He that begins a good work in you is faithful to do what? Complete it until the day of Christ. So Christ will sustain the commitment. But you, by his grace, make the choice. Just make up your mind that whatsoever God commands, whether or not you understand, just do it. So yes, walk away from a glittering career with a Harvard degree into ministry. Yes, God has said so. Just do it. Doesn't need to make sense. Just do it. Obey the voice of God. Let the word of God be enough for you. Don't ask why. Don't ask why God says, thou shalt not lie. If God said so, just do it. Don't ask why God forbids you from marrying a non adventist If God says so, just do it. Don't ask why. The question you must ask is, has God commanded? And if God has commanded, yes, Lord. Our last scripture is Luke 6, verse 46, where Jesus now asks a question that I'm going to ask us this morning. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus asks a question that bears repeating to us as his disciples this morning. Are you there? In Luke 6 verse 46. Are we there? Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How do you answer Jesus? How do you answer him? Why do you call him Lord and don't do the things that he says? If he is Lord, he must be Lord. As we conclude, I'm going to share with you a quotation that breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart because I think that many of us are in this place and condition today. Steps to Christ. I'm sorry, Christ Object Lessons, page 118. Ellen White writes, it's a very chilling statement. And if you've listened to nothing else I've said today, please listen to this. There are some who seem to always be seeking for the heavenly pearl. But they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition. They do not, they do not 
take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. Almost Christians. Almost what? Christians, but not fully Christians. They seem so near the kingdom of heaven, but they cannot enter there. Almost, but not completely saved, means not almost, but completely lost. Did you understand what I just read? There are some among us who don't take up the cross daily, and follow Jesus in the path of self-denial. And as a result, we are almost Christians. But let me tell you something, friends. There is no such thing as almost Christian. Either we are or we're not. We're almost saved. But almost saved means entirely lost. Are you following me, friends? If we do not, by the grace of God, make the choice to do lost our minds to God, we're almost saved. But almost saved means completely lost. How many of us are lost this morning, thinking we're GYC, good-looking Christians, lost? Because there are some times when God commands and we say no. Because we haven't made up our minds that we are do lost slaves of God. Almost saved almost Christians, but lost, completely lost. It would break my heart, you I see, if there are some among us this morning that are almost saved, because there's no such thing as almost saved. And I'm almost in tears, and I don't want to cry. But here's the point, friends. We've come so far, you I see, so many appeals God has made, and we have responded, have we obeyed him? Have we obeyed him? God has spoken. Have we said, yes, Lord? Or are we walking through these hallways almost saved? In reality, completely lost. I pray. I pray from the bottom of my heart that God would grant us the heart and the mind of Christ. The mind of reckless abandon to the will of God. If you're going to abandon yourself to anything, abandon yourself to the will of God. It's the safest place to be. Friends, God knows what he's doing. God is too wise to be mistaken, as the songwriter writes. God is too good to be unkind. His will is for our best. And the best choice we could ever make, the most logical and the very best choice we could ever make, is to make a pre-commitment that whatever God says, whatsoever he saith, unto us by his grace who will say yes Lord it's the best possible choice and it's the only choice that makes sense because the other half of the coin does not make sense so no turning back requires a mind that says I've voluntarily given myself to the will of God I am a do loss a slave of God. And I know slavery has many negative meanings in our world today. But if you're going to be a slave of anything, be a slave to God. Because remember, there are only two choices, right? There are only two choices. You're a slave either way you go. So turn back, you're still a slave. So why turn back to slavery to sin? Why? Either way you go, you're a slave. So choose the logical thing. Be a slave to God. It's Christ's example. And when Jesus calls us, he bids us come and die the same way he died. 
the path of servanthood, the path of do loss to God. If any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me in the path of self-denial. There's no music playing, and now I want to make one very simple appeal. Before I make the appeal, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to bow your heads and think about the implications of the word do loss. Think about it. Reason in your mind what God is calling you to do, what Christ's call is, because the call cannot be changed, friends. It is as it is. Take it or leave it. If you're going to come to Christ, you must do loss yourself to Christ. That's the call. So bow your heads and think about it in silence for a minute. Just think about it. 